What a night. If I look like I've been up since three, it's because I've been up since three. Well, we have a brand new grandbaby to show for it. Where'd all that hair come from? I have not... <laughs> That's Hannah's side of the family. Oh my goodness. Uh, I have no idea what we're naming him. Uh, came in uh, right around nine pounds. And uh, I'm just gonna go with Harry. I think it's Harry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Incredible blessing and answer to prayer and uh, all is good. Guessing we'll dedicate that little guy next weekend on Mother's Day. How would that be? That'd be awesome. Hope you can join us for that. Uh, yeah, what a night. Her water broke just before 3. They dropped uh, their kids off at our place around 3.30, and he was born at 4. Like, why mess around? In fact, she made it as far as the lobby. down at Scripps, La Jolla. Um, so I, maybe we'll name him Lobby. I don't know. It's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lobby miracle right there. So anyway, uh, rolled over to snuggle with my wife, and there were two kids between us. So um, it's been a wild night. So grab your Bibles. Uh, anybody up for an update? All right, let's jump in. I got my hoodie on. I got my hokas. Somebody turned me on to these hokas. I'm loving them. I got my vitamin C. That's what coffee is. And uh, um, well, we wrapped up in Ezekiel 18. I just love how uh, that chapter wraps up. And uh, really congrats to all who got baptized. It was absolutely incredible. What a blessing. What an amazing weekend that was and the women's conference and uh, truly spectacular. Absolutely wonderful. Loved it. Loved everything about it. Except they forgot to heat the pool. <laughs> Didn't they, Gretchen? They forgot. It was warm and toasty Saturday night. Saturday night was amazing. It was incredible. They, they heated it all day, nice and toasty. And, and the, the folks that got baptized Saturday night were the lucky ones because the guy who's in charge of heating it Saturday night onward, that guy, <laughs> lobby guy, no, I was in Guatemala, and so all these folks lined up to get baptized on Sunday, and it was just like, it was like, oh, you told me it was heated, you know, and, uh, but everyone came forward and went into the frozen tundra with uh, a great attitude. It was amazing. Freddie was the best. Freddie met me in the pool, and came down the ladder and took one, just one toe and uh, looked at Tina and looked at me and I was told, is what he said, I was told this water would be, he I'm like, I'm like in the pool already. I'm like, I'm like, I was told that too, Fred. Get in here and help warm it up. And, uh, he did, he did, cancer and all. That guy got baptized and we're just trusting the Lord with it all and praising God and believing for a miracle. Look how the chapter ended, therefore turn and live. That's the summation of the entire Bible. Turn and live. They screw up in the Garden of Eden. The Lord's response, turn and live. They mess up and get hauled off into slavery, the Lord's response, turn and live. John the Baptist shows up in the New Testament and the New Testament begins, 
with this incredible response. Turn and live. It's what repent means. Turn and live is the message of Jesus. Turn and live is the message of Ezekiel. Turn and live is the message of the Bible. And um, emphatically, I believe, is the heart, even till the end, of the Lord's appeal as he would deliver it on the Mount of Olives. He sits down looking at that scenery there on the screen from the Mount of Olives back at the city of Jerusalem, and he says to his disciples, to the end, he says, this is the heart of the gospel and message of my love letter, the Bible. Turn to me and live. And so uh, I thought we would spend just a little bit of time this weekend in a prophecy update because so much is happening in the world and I don't want us to lose sight of that message. In fact, turn to Romans with me. Let's just dive in here. Romans 11 um, is, is a summation of Ezekiel. In fact, would be clearly a summation of the entire uh, message of the Bible, and certainly the Old Testament, as, as the Apostle Paul here now connects the dots, and I want to do my best to do the same, uh, as groggy as I am, to just add, a, hopefully, a, a bit of clarity uh, to your life here as we are, in fact, living uh, at the end of the age. I don't even think it'd be proper or accurate to say anymore that the end is near. The end is here. And um, I'm so glad you're in church this morning in a Bible-believing, Jesus-saving, spirit-filling, come as you are, stop with the pretensions, turn to the Lord and live. Turn to him. And um, look at this. Look at, this is amazing. I'm just going to speak this into your life this morning and I hope and pray that um, you have ears to hear and a heart to receive it. It's, a, it's an absolutely amazing summation. Look at verse 12, Romans 11, verse 12. You got it? Now, if their fall is riches for the world, if, if their fall, if, if, their, if their mess up, if their train wreck that's my, that's my version. If their screw up, speaking of Israel right here, he's speaking of Israel, he's looking back at, at the in, entire narrative of the Old Testament saying, here's this nation that God has chosen to bless. This is his chosen people. And if they have royally screwed this up, can someone help put that into perspective for us? And Paul does. If their mess up, if their screw up, if their fall is riches for the world, and it is, that's a rhetorical question, it is because it opened the door for all of the Gentiles. It invited the dogs to the table. That's what the, that's what the Gentiles were known, known as throughout history. It opened the door and invited the whole world into a, 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 a fellowship opportunity of turning to the Lord so we can live. If their, if, their, if their fall is our gain, if their fall is riches for the world, if their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? How much more their fullness? In, in, other, in other words, God allowed that. God permitted that train wreck. God, God foresaw that they would fall, that they'd get duped by the devil, that they would eat the apple, that they would turn to a life of sin and, and instead of a 
a, a life of, of salvation. He, he sovereignly saw all of that and, and, and chose to permit that. And now here's the God opposite, turns it around and use what the enemy meant for evil, God's using for good. Their train wreck becomes your and my as Gentiles invitation to the table this morning. And then he says this, then he says, he says, how much more their fullness? I'm gonna circle back and, and bless them for how they have become now this conduit of blessing for you. I'm gonna bless them for how they became. You see, you, you know who gets saved because Israel gets hauled off into captivity from their land and home and temple and city of Jerusalem? They get hauled off to Babylon. Who gets saved in that whole thing? Hello? Nebuchadnezzar, like the Gentile of all, you're gonna meet him in heaven, that guy. Because of their train wreck, he ends up through the witness and, and testimony of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, these guys, Jeremiah's there, Ezekiel's there, they're all like palling up with the dude in his hood and he gets saved, he's like the God of Israel and you're gonna meet him in heaven because of that. That's what Paul's talking about. Their train wreck, their mess up, actually is what brought Nebuchadnezzar to a saving knowledge of the Lord. And Israel's gonna realize the blessing because of it. For I speak to you, verse 13, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles and mag magnify this, this, this mystery. If, I, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh to save some of them, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. You tracking? You following? If the first fruit, that's Israel, that's his Jewish, that's his nation, that's his people, if they're holy, the lump, you've just been called a lump. This morning, you, you just like came to church this morning. You already been called a dog and a lump. You, yeah, uh, the lump is also holy. Hallelujah! And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches are broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, okay, there you go. There's your third. Add that to your list: dogs, lumps, and wild olive trees were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches. You, you can't say that you love the land of Israel if you don't love the people of Israel. Don't boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You'll say then, branches broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, you're getting it. Paul's like, yes, preach it. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. You stand by faith. Don't be haughty, but fear. Don't get all like haughty and full of yourself. Oh, I'm a, look, look at me, man, look, I'm awesome. Look what I've done. No, you're a lump. And you're a very, very grateful branch that's been grafted in to this tree of faith. Don't boast, remember that you do not support the root. The root supports you. You'll say, then branches broken off that I might be grafted in. That's it. You get it. Because of unbelief, they were born to, you stand by, don't be haughty. But fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you, goodness. And if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. They also, they don't continue. In, if, if, they don't, if they do not continue in unbelief, they'll be, they, they'll be grafted in. God's not done with them yet. God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is 
wild by nature and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? I don't desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you become wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. It's going to circle back and complete and perfect a work in them as he has in us. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy Through their disobedience, even so, these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become his counselor? Well, let me give you some advice, God. I think maybe this is how No, who in the world, who in their right, who has become his counselor? Or or who has first given to him that, that it should be repaid to him? For of him, come on, claim this, read it with me. For of him and through him, come on, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen? Hey, amen. That's, that's the truth. That's the gospel. That's the blessing. That's the fullness. That's, that's you and I. My message is called skip to the end. Skip to the end. That's a skip to the end right there. That's a miracle in the working. Hasn't been fulfilled completely yet. But here in Romans chapter 11, we're told now what's going to be happening We're told ahead of time, this is how it's gonna go down. God has an end game, there it is. And I just briefly, this morning with you, wanna skip to the end on this coronation weekend. The end is here, man. I think the best part of that coronation, did you see a little bit of it? Um, Best part was the start. They do this big parade from uh, the palace over to church. They'll go to church, they go to Westminster. Been going to Westminster Abbey uh, to coronate their kings like since year nine. Crazy, right? And uh, the best line as they arrive at church uh, is one of the Westminster pages. I think he's like 13 years old, 12 or 13 years old. This little page, um, not Prince George, although Prince George was one of the pages, one of the Westminster Abbey pages turns and says, as children of the kingdom of God, here's here's what the page said, as children of the kingdom of God, we welcome you in the name of the king of kings. That's how it started. To which Charles then said, "I, I come in his name and desire in his likeness not to be served, but to serve. That's how it started. That was a great start. It, incre- it, got, it got a little wonky from there, but it was a great start. <laughs> it's awesome beginning. Got a little ecumenical there and watered down and 
And, uh, you know, he used to be known as the defender of the faith. And that, sadly, is a title that's in the process of being dropped. It's, it's, it's sadly in transition. It was the defender of the faith when his mom was coronated. Canada, where my family's from, Canada's already dropped the title. They don't call the king the defender of the faith any longer. The has been dropped. Now it's the defender of faith. And that's why so many faiths sadly were represented in the coronation yesterday. In fact, they've now made it plural. He's the defender of faiths. And that, my friends, is sad because all of that, and, and here's the deception, is convincing the world that, that it's all the same. And so here's what you didn't see yesterday in the, in the, in the coronation when he was finally crowned, when the crown was placed on his head by the Archbishop Canterbury, the Archbishop said, um, God save the king, and uh, that, that's how it went. But when his mom was crowned, this is what the Archbishop said, I give thee, O gracious lady, this was 70 years ago, I realize, but here's what the Archbishop said, I give thee, O gracious lady, this crown to wear until he who deserves the right to wear it shall return. Hallelujah, man, awesome. That's awesome. And that was sadly missing yesterday in the coronation. And, uh, and so this morning we'll do our best to um, restore today what was missing yesterday because this is our coronation this is us taking the elements of this meal and crowning him once again, King of Kings and Lord of Lords over our lives, both now and forevermore. There's this really amazing little verse in First Chronicles that talks to us about this whole idea that, that Paul is putting before us in Romans chapter 11. And First Chronicles, it says, who is like your people, Israel? This is a question that is raised. It's an amazing verse. Look at this with me. Just jot yourself a note, maybe to look it up later. You could turn there in your Bible. Who's like your people, Israel? The one nation. Not five, not 10, not 222, not 15. One nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people to make for yourself a name by great and awesome deeds. And yet, this morning as we sit in church together and ponder these things on a coronation weekend, there is a huge division amongst that nation right now. There is a, a division uh, internally within Israel that is taking place along with a growing global animosity that is surrounding Israel this morning as we speak. And yet, look at that verse. That, this is the one, the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself. And yet, right now, uh, their enemies are smelling blood in the water because of the internal divisions that are seeking to destroy that country. And this growing animosity that is surrounding that nation. Well, let me just, let me just skip to the end. Um, lasting peace, here's a thought, will only come to Israel when the Prince of Peace returns. And so you, you see this tension, you, you feel this tension, you, you, you wonder about this tension, this, this, this growing tension, both from without as well as from within, and, and you begin to ponder these things. Like, God, what, what's going on? What is, well, there will truly never be any lasting peace whatsoever. Oh, there'll be this false peace through an antichrist that will temporarily come on the scene for a moment to relieve some of the 
pressure in the pressure cooker, but no lasting peace will come to Israel until the Prince of Peace returns. And God completes and fulfills his promise that Paul has now alluded to there in Romans chapter 11. Wow. And in the process of all of that, those of you that are still with me this morning who are up for an update, let me remind you of a few other things, if I may, please. Christianity is not the cancellation of Judaism. And there's a bunch of churches out there that have got that idea all wound up around the wrong tree. Christianity is not the cancellation of Judaism. I'm sorry. We're actually the extension of it, not the replacement. This replacement theology that's being thrown around on the internet is becoming some mega popular of a movement within millennials. This replacement theology that somehow the church has replaced Israel is false. That's nonsense. Don't buy into that garbage. We're not here for replacement theology. It's fulfillment theology that Paul's talking about. This is the fulfillment of some wild lumps of Gentile sinfulness that have actually been welcomed into the fellowship to have a seat at the table of the Lord. And that is not to replace God's plan for Israel, but to be the fulfillment of what God is desiring to accomplish in both camps. Jew and Gentile, to which he says are both aligned. There is now no longer Jew or Gentile, male or female or, or, or bond or free. Or, all are one in Christ. And who can do that except the Lord himself? In fact, there's this spectacular little verse in, in Isaiah chapter 66 that asks a question similar to the one that's raised in 1 Chronicles where, where, where Isaiah says, who can establish a nation in a day? This nation was dead and gone. This nation was dead and gone. This whole language had become a dormant language. The Hebrew language was dormant and the nation was dead. And then Isaiah asks, who could rise this nation from the ashes? Who could rise this nation up again? Who could, read it, it's in Isaiah chapter 60. Who could establish this nation in a day? Can a nation be born all at once, he asks? Only God. Only God can do that. And so he has his hand upon this little sliver of a land called Israel, smaller than the state of New Jersey. And uh, here's a thought. The, The continued existence, miraculously, of that nation. Here's a thought. The continued existence of the nation of Israel is absolute proof of the existence of God. You're like wondering sort of where to start in the conversation of reaching out to your Jewish friends and and business partners and associates and neighbors and coworkers. There's a thought to start with. Hey, this continued miraculous existence of a sliver of a nation so surrounded by strife, both from without and from within, is absolute proof of the existence of God. And yet here you have the agenda of nations such as Russia seeking to wipe Israel out, and Iran, and uh, China, China now, in cahoots with Russia, these these empires now, even within the last few weeks or, 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 or months, coming together in concert, Russia with China, and, 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 and here you have the whole debacle still uh, going down where Ukraine is concerned, you have, you have Iran, you have, you have all of this and you just sort of like, you know, throw a little, yeah. Um, and there's that little, look at that little teeny, you know, the magnifying glass. It's sort of like, yeah, and there's like all of these surrounding client states of Russia and Iran. And it's not the Iranian people, I love them. But this Iranian 
political regime from the Ayatollah. It's the number one terroristic threat in the world. And yet, at the same time, that's the fastest growing church in the world. Did you realize that? It's the fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. And yet, at the same time, you have this, we're going to wipe you off the face of the map so that it looks as if you never even existed. The elimination of what they refer to as the Zionist entity. And, and they're just like packing all of, of their armory into these surrounding client states of Syria and, and Lebanon and Turkey. And, 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 and Iran is just growing in, 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 in all of this. And, and, uh, and Yemen. And, and, and the, they, got, they got Israel now surrounded on all sides as Arab nations that Arab nations that used to want absolutely nothing to do with each other, that were actually internally fighting like Israel finds itself fighting today. These these Arab nations were also fighting Sunni against Shiite that have now combined forces against Israel. And you got 100 rockets last week, 100 rockets from Gaza alone fired into Israel. I mean, our nation can hardly stand one single balloon. Imagine that balloon being a rocket. Okay, now times that one balloon that is now a rocket by 100 rockets, and that's just what's coming from Gaza because they're also coming from Lebanon. From the Islamic Hamas and from Hezbollah and from the Houthis of Yemen. So you have this political agenda that is going against this, this nation, this one nation that that, that, that God has called his, his homeland, his, his people. And it, it just isn't like the, the nuclear invasion of all of these nations, this, this nuclear arsenal that is surrounding Israel. It's not just political, but it's also economic. You, you have this military invasion around Israel, but you also are watching, and I'm sure some of you could speak to it even with greater clarity than I can, but there is this, there is this currency shift economically that, that, is, that, is, that may be impacting you and I more than the political strife that surrounds Israel as a nation, although you're going to feel the ramifications of that political strife as well, but you're certainly feeling as if you have a front row seat to the currency. There is a currency shift currently underway, and this will also become the next big squeeze. Did you read this week that they are now criminalizing the use of cash in Europe? Criminalizing. I mean, I know it's become you know, somewhat of a, a, a foreign thing around here for you to be in the checkout line at the grocery store and somebody actually in front of you uses cash? You're kind of like, come on, let's get going here. And now they want to criminalize that guy in Europe for holding up the program and, and using cash and, 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 and this currency shift away from the dollar. Let's just skip to the end because the dollar's doomed. And you're seeing banks closing by the day and things that you thought you had freedom to enjoy, you're wondering where your freedoms went. I mean, that was, that was the whole agenda of COVID. Let's see how many of these freedoms we can remove. Let's see just how isolated we can make them. This big experiment to see just how far they could push the mice in the cage. And it has filled the world with fear. And sadly for many, their fears have trumped their faith so that it's not in the God of the Bible any longer. And sadly, if we skip to the end, that's exactly how the Bible says it will go down in the end. The Lord himself would even say, upon his return, will he even find faith on the earth? So you have this 
economic, commerce-driven agenda that is changing vastly the way that our dollar has been used and the world has been shaped. You have this uh, formation, not just politically, but economically of these nations, these BRIC nations, B-R-I-C, but they've added an S now because other nations are sort of growing in their power and popularity. BRIC stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and, and all that then would shove the U.S. dollar off of the table in this grand experiment. And then you just have, socially, you have, you have politically, you have economically, you have socially. I don't know if you watched the Grammys a few weeks ago. That was the most blatant global display of Satanism that I've ever seen on television. The outright celebration of all things Satanic. And this whole agenda of transgenderism, it is an absolute outright assault against God himself. People thinking they're free to do whatever, whatever they want. You're not free because you do whatever you want. You're actually a slave to your desires and sins and passions. You're not free until you come to Jesus. And some of you are like thinking, well, that sounds opposite. That is an opposite. That's a God opposite. That's a God opposite. You're not free until you come to me, he says. You got a whole generation that is saying, wait a minute, you're saying, I'm not free until I come to him. I don't want to come to him. Well, you're never going to be free then. You're going to be bound in your sin. And he's trying to set you free from that for eternity, for whom the sun sets free is free. And do you mean I'm not free until he, I come under his control? You got it, exactly. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. Until you become a part of this tree. No, I'd rather just remain wild. Wild in your sin is not freedom. You're not free because you can do whatever your passions desire. You're actually enslaved. And that's the whole agenda of Satan, and he really isn't all that creative in his agenda. It's the same strategy since the beginning. What was the first attack that the enemy launched against God? It was an attack of authority. Who's in charge? And did God really say? It was an attack of authority was attack against the spoken word of God. Did God really say? And that attack of authority with the notion, what's, what's, what's the notion of a seed that he plants in her brain? That you can be your own God. Paul has something to say about that too. Paul, Paul's amazing. Paul just helps connect these dots for us. Wow. And in 2 Corinthians, he's, he's writing this letter to a church. And he's super concerned about the direction in which this church is taking. So he writes this letter. What do you think his letter would be like if he wrote a letter to the, the church today? You know, if Paul was still around, we'd be getting a letter. And here he writes, he writes to Corinth and he says, I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Oh, you can be your own God. Oh, you can decide if you're a, if you're a man, you can decide you're a woman. Men are never women. And women are never men ever, end of story. Created in the image of God, male and female. No, 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 I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Stop complicating everything. And just come back like with childlike faith, guys, to a full trust and dependency upon what the Lord himself has done for you and your families. Because I'm, I'm, I'm fearing, I'm, I'm concerned lest somehow the serpent that deceived Eve is also going to deceive you. I spoke in chapel for our kids this last Thursday at Horizon Prep, and here's the, here's the danger that scares me to death, is that it's become more of an issue 
where you go to school than what you're taught in school. Just come back, come back from allowing your minds to be corrupted by the world. Just come back to the simplicity that that is in Christ. Just come back, come back, come back, come back home. Come back to him. Just crawl up into his lap today, mom. Just trust him and love knowing that you can. That yeah, you're a lump, but you are a loved lump. You're wild branch, but he's grafted you into us. The next verse says this. Look at the next verse. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. For if he, still talking about the serpent that deceived Eve here, okay? He, capital H. If he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached or a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted, Here's his concern. Here's his fear. You may well put up with it. A different Jesus, a a, a different gospel. That, well, you know, Bob, I, yeah, but love is love. God is love. Let's come back. Lest you end up buying hook lying and sinker, a, 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 a new Jesus, which isn't this Jesus at all, a new gospel, which isn't this gospel at all, a new spirit, which isn't his spirit at all. Careful, careful. And here's what I want to be really careful of. I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're not going to get to Ezekiel 38 before the world gets there. So let's skip to the end. Just turn to Ezekiel with me real quick and and, uh, and let me show you a few things and we'll celebrate communion. You with me? You tracking? Are we good? We all right? Okay, Ezekiel chapter 38. Just a couple things. This is gonna skip to the end here. Because here's what he says. The word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face against Gog. These are, these are, these are titles. This is, this is uh, uh, in the land of Magog. This is Russia. This is that, that, that whole push politically that we're, that we're seeing against Israel. Gog and the land of Magog and the, and the prince of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against them and say, I'm against you, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you. Gog and prince of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal. And I'm gonna turn you around and I'm gonna put hooks in your jaw and lead you out with, with your army, your horses, your horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, okay, so Persia joins the Russian team, Persia. Iran was known as Persia all the way up until the 1930s. So we're talking Iran here and Ethiopia, which would be modern day Sudan. That's interesting because of the civil war that's going on in Sudan as we speak. Libya, they're all with them. All of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, well, golly. No, that's Turkey. That would be, that'd be Turkey. All of its troops, the house of Togamath from the far north, all of its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself, be ready. You and all your companies that are gathered about you and be on guard for them. For after many days, you'll be visited. So here they're coming. Where are they going? After many days, you'll be visited. In the latter years, you'll come into the land, brought you back from the sword and gathered many people from the mountains of Israel, which which have long been desolate. We've we've seen this. We've seen this in our lifetime. We've seen a, a desolate, dead language, empty land, become once again a nation, whether you would appoint that to 1948 in this very same month of May, May 1948, or 1967 when Jerusalem was then added as now the return capital of Israel in 1967. Look what he says. He says, these people have come, long been desolate, now brought out of the other nations, and now all of them dwelling in the land, coming back safely. We've seen this fulfillment of prophecy. And, and you will ascend, you will come like a storm. These nations will come against them. Russia, Iran, the Arab states of Africa, in Ethiopia and Sudan and, 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 and Libya. You, you will come like a storm covering the land, like a cloud, you and all the troops, many peoples that are with you. And then there's like some um, bystanders that are watching the whole thing go down. Look at verse 13, Sheba, 
And Dedan, this is Saudi Arabia, this would be the whole Arabian Peninsula to the east of Israel, all of those Arab states on the peninsula. Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, they're listed here, that's interesting. The mer- so you have the Arab states to the east of Israel, and now all the way to the western end of the Mediterranean. Tarshish, you remember, that's where Jonah flees to, right? In his rebellion and disobedience, he goes to Tarshish, It's an interesting word. Some people want to liken Tarshish to Spain. It's very much the greater European area to the western end of the Mediterranean. Tarshish means tin. And and, and literally, Tarshish would be the isle or island of tin. It was pretty fascinating if you do a root study of the word Britain. So here you have this push from the east of all of these Arab states represented by Saudi Arabia and Sheba and Dedan and all the way to the western end of the Mediterranean, Tarshish, or it could be the United Kingdom, could could be Spain, could be Britain, and their young lions that could be the colonies that break out of the United Kingdom. And it could very well be, and it's a stretch, a distant reference to America in end times prophecy, but that's a stretch the young lions, and they're all watching this. They're watching this political move, even as you and I are watching the evening news. You're watching Russia now in all of these talks with Iran and with Syria and with Turkey and with Saudi Arabia and with China, and you're like, wow, what's going on? And that's exactly what they're saying here. What's going on? Have you come to take plunder? What's going on? Have you gathered your army to take booty? Are, are you going to carry away silver and gold and take away livestock and goods and, 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 and a great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from the place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a great army. Okay, so you have an army that starts the great tribulation. The great tribulation is commenced with an army, and I believe it's this army here, this war in Ezekiel chapter 38. You have an army that commences, and and a, and a war that commences, a battle that commences the Great Tribulation, and a battle that culminates the Great Tribulation. Not the same battle. One commences it, and one culminates it. The one that commences it is this battle here in Ezekiel chapter 38. The one that culminates it is the battle of Armageddon that's interrupted by the return of Jesus Christ. In the meantime, you have a cleanup where this battle is concerned. And of all the battles in Scripture, like there's over 100 in the Old Testament alone, there's only one battle where there's like almost an entire chapter devoted to the cleanup. And it's this battle here. In fact, look at Ezekiel 39, real fast. Look at this. Look at verse 8. Surely it is coming. Ezekiel 39, verse 8. Surely it is coming, and it'll be done, says the Lord. So mark that. Prophecy is history before it's happened. This will be done, says the Lord. This is the day of which I have spoken. So here's the cleanup. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the javelins and the spears, and they will make fires for them for seven years. There's your period of the great tribulation. And the place is burning for all seven years. Now this made no sense to Spurgeon. This made no sense to anyone prior to the great war. This made no sense to anyone prior to the nuclear age. You're like, what? They're going to burn how long? What's going to burn? And it's going to burn so well and so hot, you don't have to cut down another tree. Look at verse 10. They will not take wood from the field or cut down any from the forest because they will make fires of the the weapons. Plunder all this nuclear. and, And maybe the Bible here is actually more advanced than we are. Hello, in its description of what we are barely beginning to fully understand where the ramifications of 
one nuclear age and the consequences with that would be. And he's like, uh, yeah, you're not ever going to need to go to Lowe's and get firewood again. Because all the weapons are going to burn and they're going to burn hot for seven years. And they will plunder and, 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 and look at this. They will plunder those who plundered them and pillage those who pillaged them, says the Lord. In other words, those who moved in with the attempts and desires of destroying Israel will be destroyed. They came to destroy. They came to burn and they're burned. God wins. Israel wins. The people of God win. There's a new city that's actually formed as a result of all of this rubble. They take it all. Look at verse 11. It'll come to pass on that day that I will give God a burial place in the land of Israel in the valley of those who pass by the east of the sea. That's the Dead Sea. That's all the way down at the very desolate end of the south end where, where no one lives. Just take all of this nuclear waste, move it all down there, and it'll obstruct travelers because they're, it's, and it Barry Gog, and, and interesting because it's gonna obstruct travelers. Do you know where the plans are for the new airport? Right there. Like Tel Aviv has just gotten too populated and crazy. They're looking for a new place to land down there on the south end of Israel and north end of Egypt. That's where they're burying all of Gog the multitude, and it's actually going to obstruct travelers according to the scriptures. Wow. And they will call it the Valley of Haman Gog. And for seven months, the house of Israel will be burning them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all of the people of the land will be, will, will be burying, and, and, and they, will, they will gain renown for it on the day that I am glorified, says the Lord. God wins in the end. That the whole, listen, the whole doom and gloom, and it does sound rather, wow, this is heavy. But for a Christian, the doom and gloom for us as Christians is actually boom and zoom. <laughs> the world's doom and gloom is the sound of a trumpet, boom, and the twinkling of an eye, zoom, we're out of here. When you begin to see these things, Jesus says, look up, your redemption is right around the corner. And geopolitically, where it all began is where it all ends. In fact, look at verse 21. And I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed, my hand, which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord, their God, from that day forward, and may I simply add, and forevermore. Church, you don't have to fret about this stuff. You don't have to stress about this stuff. You don't have to worry about this stuff. This is what I mean by the title. And here's the double meaning of the title. You can skip to the end. My grandson this week after chapel, he said, Grandpa, guess what I learned how to do? I learned how to skip. And he's showing me his new dance move. And he's skipping across the stage. He's skipping through the courtyard. And it was all I needed, you know, for the Lord to say, Bob, tell the church they could skip to the end. I've got you. You're my lump. You're who I love. You could skip to the end. You could, listen, here's your option. You can stress to the end. Or you could sin to the end. You can sleep and slumber your way to the end. Or you can skip to the end. How about we skip to the end? How about the world look at us with great wonder as to what is it you know that I don't know because I'm freaking out about everything that's happening politically, economically, socially, every aspect educationally, and you just seem to have, I don't know, a spring in your step. I'm skipping to the end. My God wins. He's on the throne. He's in control. And as you take this cup, as you take this bread, may we on this coronation weekend proclaim him to be our Lord and our King, both now and forever. In Jesus' name. Can you praise him for that, church? Amen.
Father, we love how you love us. Oh, that you would show yourself strong these days on our lives, Lord, that you would just melt hearts that are hard, filled with pride and sinfulness. Lord, would you just in this meal break through all of that? things that we get all wound up about, stressed out about, and like a pig returning to the stupid mud hole, like a dog to its vomit, the Bible says. So oftentimes we will circle back to a life that was once entirely void of you live for our flesh and we pray that you'd forgive us. We regret those moves. We pray now that you would honor this move of obedience, of just drawing closer to you in these last days. putting our full hope, all of our trust, all of our weight on what you've accomplished for us on the cross. Not freaking out by the affairs that are happening in the world around us. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, through prayer, thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God and the peace of God. Listen, Maybe we're anxious about everything because we're not praying about anything. How about we flip that around on its ear this morning? Start praying about everything so that we're anxious for nothing. We could skip to the end. Help us to sing to the end, Lord. Help us to study your scriptures. Study to show yourselves approved. That we'd study to the end. We would strengthen one another as marriages and families to the end. We would seek to see the lost found to the end. Souls saved to the end. I love this quote by Lewis. Do you guys have that quote by Lewis handy by chance? Can you throw that up? I want you to think about this as we celebrate communion. One of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis, look what it says. My hope is that when I die, all of hell rejoices that I'm out of the fight. May our lives, our faith, may, may may the skip in our step drive Satan nuts. May our faith be a living hell for Satan and a blessing of honor and glory to our King Jesus. Amen? Let's all stand together and once the men come, we'll partake of communion.